Tonight, we will talk about the jhanas. So with uh, meditation training, we talked about last night how there's maybe three aspects, the sila, dana, uh, bhavana. So sila is morality, that is following the precepts and avoiding unwholesome courses of action. When we do that, we prevent uh, negative aspects to enter our mind stream. We can help prevent and mitigate hindrances. Uh, we avoid the unwholesome courses of action. And these are basically things done uh, based on greed, uh, desire, and delusion. Or I don't want it, I want it, and I or mine. Yeah. The other aspect of our foundation for meditation training is dana, which is generosity. This is adding positive aspects to, uh, to our mind stream. So this is doing the wholesome courses of action. Um, this uh, is important. It again, builds up our capacity for successful meditation. Dana can be giving physically. It can be donating. It can be doing things, donating time and so on. And that's very important and very beneficial and dana can be in our speech and mind. Loving kindness is a great example of dana by the mind. In the suttas, they talk about the benefits of loving kindness as absolutely tremendous. The, the merit gained by pervading the world with loving kindness, even for a few seconds, for a minute, is, is fantastic. So we can see this uh, in people around us. When we smile, when we send them loving kindness, they respond with positive uh, responses, usually too. Um, and it's certainly good for them, even if they don't smile back, that they had someone smile at them, they had to deal with that, yeah. Um, we are affecting the world around us when we practice this way. Uh, we can we can look at neuroscience and talk about mirror neurons. We talk about how when we see someone who is happy, we reflect that in our body mind uh, very simply, and so we affect our community. We in fact uh, we affect our sangha. We affect our environment, just as we are affected by these things as well. And in fact, there's a great interconnection uh, between ourselves and those around us. So when we practice loving kindness, it is a great benefit to ourselves because we are happy and we learn to benefit our mind and it's a great benefit to those we interact with. And this sets us up to do uh, bhavana, to do meditation with a foundation of avoiding the unwholesome uh, courses of action. Uh, doing the wholesome courses of action, we have a mind that is ready uh, to train and look at itself. With meditation, we are learning how our mind works. We are learning to look at the world in a way that is impersonal and see what happens uh, as it is, as a result of interconnectedness, as a result of conditions, and not as a result of us. What we have learned is what we want when we try, when we have an image of reality, and it doesn't line up with reality, that is a cause of suffering. And in fact, our image of what reality should be is a driver of our behavior. What we imagine something should be, when we act on that, we set ourselves up for disappointment. Whereas if we act on what is, what is happening, we set ourselves up uh, for not suffering, for happiness, yeah. So to do this investigation on mind, we have to set up conditions. Um, we, our habitual way of being in the world is how we've been doing it most of our lives, unless, until we start uh, training mind. So this is the purpose of jhana. Jhana is uh, a way of increasing our mindfulness and it is a result of successful uh, practice. It is both. Uh, 
what we practice is samatha vipassana. Uh, samatha refers to collectedness of mind. Vipassana refers to seeing things as they are. Uh, another training uh, schema is, a common training schema is sila, uh, samadhi, panya. So morality, uh, collectiveness, appropriate collectiveness, and clear seeing. That's another way of seeing what we're doing. When we practice meditation like this, we are cultivating collectiveness at the same time we are cultivating clear seeing into what is happening. Uh, they go hand in hand. The more clearly we see what is happening, the more collected our mind can become. And uh, they work in conjunction simultaneously. So the mind state we need to cultivate in order to develop our mind needs to have the ability to see change and see what is happening. There are three characteristics of conditioned reality that we can talk about. Uh, they are uh, impermanence, anicca, uh, unsatisfactoriness, dukkha, and not-self or non-self, anatta. When we are practicing meditation, we are learning about these and developing insight into these. Now, we develop insight passively over time. We don't push our minds into our concepts <clears throat> of these three characteristics, hoping to see them. <clears throat> As we practice the six R's, excuse me. <clears throat> As we practice the six R's, and our mind lets go of hindrances, we naturally start to see these in the course of practice. Um, it's unavoidable. So impermanence is about how things change. Everything changes. We see this on every scale of our experience. We see seasons changing. We see life coming and going. We see Dhammasukha changing, growing. We see it in ourselves. Um, we see hair changing. We are so, see ourselves maturing. We see it in our experience. Sights come and go. Feelings come and go. And we see it in the fine grain in our experience. When we look closely and we, when we see closely at what's happening, things are changing rapidly. Eventually we can see consciousness arise and pass away quickly. Impermanence and all of the three characteristics can be uncomfortable when we start noticing it. In fact, when we start deeply seeing impermanence, fear can arise. When fear arises in meditation, uh, the instructions are clear. Uh, they are to keep doing what you're doing. Stay in the same posture until the fear passes. Fear is a feeling. Fear is a habitual tendency. It's a hindrance. When it comes up and goes away, uh, when we let it go, on the other side of fear is usually nothing that scary. When fear arises in our meditation, uh, which happens to pretty much everyone, often on the brink of something that is quite exciting, a new state, oh my, this is real, oh, this is happening, fear comes up. You put a toe over the line, you see if it's that scary or not, and you can back off. Don't push it. Try again. Was it that scary? No, it turns out not to be. So when we investigate the three characteristics, I, it may initially seem like this, but as we understand them more, uh, they actually uh, lead to states of mind that are quite positive. Now, dukkha, or unsatisfactoriness is very related to impermanence. We cannot rely on anything in our experience uh, as self, as it appears. It will ultimately change and ultimately not be a source of true satisfaction. 
Uh, that is the quality of, of conditioned experience. And then there's anatta, not self, which is very uh, challenging to translate. Ultimately, anatta means impersonal, means happening as a result of conditions. It does not mean there is no self, or if you attain a particular state that yourself will go away or something like that. Well, now we're talking about words, but everything will continue. And this is where fear comes in when your mind goes, oh my, everything is changing. Everything is conditioned. What am I then? Yeah. But the fact is when you drop or weaken the perspective of I am, everything is still there. And in fact, everything is better. Beauty remains, joy remains. What you lose is proliferation. What you lose is layers of ideas upon reality that are not true. What you lose is a false perspective of me and that. And what is left is what is and always was. Beauty, we talk about words like last night about being humiliated by sense desires, but I want to point out, or uh, humiliated by uh, sensory perception in training. But the writings of Arhats, Fully Awakened Ones, talk about appreciation of beauty, talk about appreciation of the natural world. And we are not, as we more develop, we are not moving away from appreciation and positive states. Uh, that is not what is happening. We're moving into happiness and uh, uh, more appreciation and engagement with what we are doing in our lives. Though the training may involve carefully watching how we interact with our senses, how we interact with our thoughts, how we interact with other people. What it leads to is freedom. And so we'll start with uh, the Anapada Sutta, one by one as they occurred. Now this is one of Bhante's favorite suttas. I may have heard it many, many times. And the way I read it may be unavoidably similar to how he does, but we shall see. Thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was living in Savati at Jetta's Grove, Anathambindika's Park. There he addressed the monks thus, Monks, venerable sir, they replied. The Blessed One said this, Monks, Sariputta is wise. Sariputta was one of the Buddha's chief disciples. Uh, the Buddha had two chief disciples, Sariputta and Mahamogalana. They, uh, the chief disciples were, uh, were uh, talked about by their qualities. Sariputta was second only to the Buddha in wisdom. Wisdom, of course, is the ability to see dependent origination. When we look at the life of Sariputta, it's quite, quite interesting. He was quite, uh, quite a monk. Um, not only was he in charge of training of the younger monks, he was in charge of bringing people up to the first stage of awakening and, uh, and was excellent at expounding the Dhamma. But he was an incredibly kind and compassionate guy. When you hear stories of the monks moving, uh, Sariputta would always arrive late because he was helping people that were having trouble moving, he was taking care of the ill, he was taking care of other people. And so as, even though he was in charge in so many ways, he was, he was uh, on the ground helping people personally. So the compassion of Sariputta is remarkable. And the wisdom of Sariputta is remarkable. He is one who had the four analytic knowledges. Um, the four analytic knowledges are deeply understanding the Dhamma, deeply understanding causality, and deeply understanding language in a way that allowed him to present the Dhamma in a way that is clear and very accessible to his listener. Um, 
So you see throughout the suttas many, uh, many suttas with Sariputta in them. Um, so, and the Buddha is saying, Sariputta is wise. Sariputta has great wisdom. Sariputta has wide wisdom. Sariputta has joyous wisdom. Sariputta has quick wisdom. Sariputta has keen wisdom. Sariputta has a penetrative wisdom. During half a month, monks, Sariputta gained insight into states one by one as they occurred. In half a month of training, uh, Sariputta attained the final stage of awakening. This was a very long time at that time. Uh, many of his peers took a week or some a sermon, yeah. But Sariputta took two weeks. And why did it take so long? Because he had so much to figure out. Um, because he had so much to work through. Uh, and that is, that is why he was so wise. Now Sariputta's insight into states one by one as they occurred was this. Here monks, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, Sensual pleasures are sights, tastes, sounds, um, like that. The chords of sensual desire. Sensual desire is lust for the sensual pleasures, uh, getting involved with them and wanting them and craving and clinging to them. Secluded from unwholesome states, Oh, and secluded from sensual pleasures. When we meditate, we seclude ourselves from sensual pleasures. We close our eyes to limit our vision. We do not move our body to limit uh, contact with uh, body. We are not tasting things usually. We are not smelling things usually. Uh, hearing is the hardest one to seclude ourselves from. Uh, but that is what we try to do also to seclude ourselves from sensual pleasures. Secluded from unwholesome states, this means he did not have the hindrances. When one is in jhana, one does not have a hindrance. Sariputta entered upon and abided in the first jhana, which is accompanied by thinking and examining thought with joy and happiness born of seclusion. So when we are meditating, we are with our object of meditation, loving kindness, or whatever our object is. We rest in our object, observing our object. And then of course, uh, hindrances can arise. We may hear a sound leading to feeling, leading to craving, leading to thinking about it, leading to forgetting what we're doing. When the sound is persistent, uh, it pulls us away from our meditation object. So we six are. We, we let it be there. We do not attend to it. We relax our head and our body and smile and come back to our meditation object. Now, it's the nature of everything that arises to pass away, impermanence, yes, unless conditions keep them there, unless there is attachment, um, unless there is attention. And in most cases, our hindrances have attachment behind them. And so our thoughts about the sound will persist. And so we go back, find ourselves back thinking about the sound again. So we six R and we come back. And that we get pulled again, yeah. And remember from this place of going back and forth, one of a couple of things will happen. One is we will give in to action. We will forget our mindfulness and we will break our meditation or whatever it is. If it's an itch, we'll scratch it. Um, if it's a thought, we'll act on it and so on. Or uh, we will let it go and we will develop equanimity. We will 6R and come back and 6R and eventually a different hindrance or distraction will take its place 
but we have equanimity around that thought or feeling or hindrance and it will no longer pull our attention anymore. Or the third option is we will let go of that attachment. When we starve our attachment of that hindrance of our attention over and over again, it has a chance to go away. So as our attachment and hindrance is there, we relax and it pulls us again. We 6R and come back and eventually it dissipates. And in this instance, when it dissipates, right after an instant it dissipates, we have relief. We have released, we have that attachment has gone away. He can feel like a weight is lifted off your shoulders. And right after that relief comes joy and happiness in the body and mind. This joy and happiness can be uh, quite remarkable, particularly the first times you experience it. It can have excitement with it and uh, be quite a change. At the same time that happens, our mind becomes calm. With the hindrance gone, our mind calms down and it can be very steady with the meditation object. At this stage, there may be small amounts of thoughts that come up and go away, but they don't pull our attention. This disturbance of mind does not bother us as we attend to the meditation object. And this joy and excitement persists for a period of time, five minutes, 10 minutes, 40 minutes, it depends. And when it passes, we are left with great comfort in the body, happiness, sukha. This is how the first jhana arises. And this is how we first enter the first jhana, practicing uh, like this. And the states in the first jhana, the thinking, the examining thought, the excitement, the pleasure, and the unification of mind, the body, feeling, perception, formations, and mind, the enthusiasm, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity, and attention, these states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. So these are lists of the states that arise in the first jhana. So you can see the, the five aggregates are rising in the first jhana. We have body, feeling, perception, uh, formations, and mind. And we have equanimity and mindfulness arising as well. These states are happening one at a time. They are not happening uh, all at once. Um, and, and they are clearly seen. He understood thus. So indeed, these states, not having been, come into being. Having been, they vanish. Regarding these states, he abided unattracted, unrepelled, independent, detached, free, dissociated with the mind, rid of barriers. And so he was able to see uh, these states, though they were pleasant, and not be attached to them and allow them to come and go. This is important, uh, for we enter jhana by letting go of attachment we return to jhana by letting go of attachment. We don't return to jhana by wanting it. And this is a tough thing to do, particularly after the first couple of times. When you have a sit like this at first, your immediate reaction is, oh yes, I want more of that. Let's do that again. Now, yeah. And so invariably one will put in way too much energy in the practice and one will have a lot of restlessness. Because what are you doing there? You have an image of how you want reality to be. And you're trying to make that image line up with what is happening. And that is the way you are in conflict with what is, what is happening. That's the way you cause yourself suffering. Eventually with practice, uh, it is very possible to enter into, into the jhanas again. He understood, 
there is an escape beyond, and with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is. Again, monks, with the stilling of applied and sustained thought, Sariputta entered and abided in the second jhana. We enter the second jhana um, in a very similar way as the first jhana. What generally starts to happen is when one is in the first jhana, one starts noticing those small thoughts and distractions actually are distractions and actually are pulling attention. Why it may not be obvious at first. And so you start six Ring these smaller distractions. And as you can six R those smaller distractions, eventually the same process happens again, where you can let that attachment go associated with them, let that dissipate. And then mind will go deeper into the second jhana, which has self-confidence and singleness of mind without thinking and examining thought. So the second jhana is said to have confidence. This is because at this point you are getting familiar with this process. And it's likely you're having jhana arise uh, frequently in practice. And you're seeing how this works and you're understanding how it works and that brings confidence. And it is without thinking and examining thought. And this is an important thing to note as well, because the second jhana will not have verbal thinking in it. And when you try to bring verbal thinking to the second jhana, it will cause tension. This often manifests as a headache. Um, and the solution to this is you stop verbalizing. But this means you stop saying the wishes uh, for your spiritual friend at that time, for the wishes are going to be causing trouble. At this point, with your confidence, you can simply bring up loving kindness. Just bring it up by itself w without the need for a wish, and you can rest in it that way. At times, you will lose loving kindness still, and you'll have to 6R and bring it up uh, as usual but it won't include a verbal wish. There's other times in practice we may develop a headache. And headaches often come when we are trying too hard. When we are trying to fit what is happening with our image of it. When we're trying to make uh, something be the way we expect it to be. That can bring up a headache. And this is a challenge with suttas like this, uh, is because this gives us very clear information about what can and will happen with successful practice. This is a map of what can happen. And when you know what can happen, you may try to fit your experience into that. We also do this when we expect our meditation to be a particular way, when we expect ourselves to not be sitting as deeply as our mind wants to be, or we expect our meditation object to feel a particular way, and we try to make it be a different way. This will also generate tension and a headache. So suttas like this are very important. Um, it's helpful to have a map. But it's also important to know the map is not the territory. So how we imagine the description of these states is, um, no matter how vivid they are written, it is not the same as your experience. And invariably you'll have an idea of what it is to get in a particular jhana, and then you're there and it is not quite like that. So. It's important to know basically what to do at intersections, but it's also important to be curious about it, what exactly it will be like. We won't know until we're there. Which has self-confidence and singleness of mind without applied and sustained thought, with rapture and with uh, 
with joy and happiness born of collectedness. In the states of the second jhana, the self-confidence, the joy, the happiness, and the unification of mind, the body, feeling, perception, formations, and mind, the enthusiasm, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity, and attention. These states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. Known these states arose, known they were present, and known they disappeared. So the second jhana has quite a bit of joy in it, like the first jhana. Like the first jhana, it is, has some excitement in the joy as well. When we talk about joy, we can talk about five different kinds of joy that can arise. The first three kinds of joy are worldly joy that just happen uh, to anyone without practicing meditation or mental development. These are joy, one is like goosebumps, yeah, goosebumps, a little shiver. One is like a lightning bolt, a sudden flash of very intense joy um, that comes suddenly and goes suddenly. And another is like waves that wash up and wash down, up and down. And then we have joys that we can talk about in terms of mental cultivation. One is uplifting joy. In uplifting joy, when one has that, one feels light in the body and happy. With uplifting joy, your fake smile becomes a real toothy grin. Um, and it can feel like you're floating. That is possible to feel like that. And then uh, there is uh, all-pervading joy. All-pervading joy is an interesting one uh, because when you have that, uh, you, your eyes may open in meditation. This is what many Buddha statues show is uh, the Buddha sitting there with eyes gently open in front of him. That's what happens with your eyes in all-pervading joy. You will be sitting there uh, meditating comfortably and eyes will pop open. And you'll close them again and they'll pop open again and they just will want to stay open. And this is a result of uh, all-pervading joy. Now, at this time, you can't really seclude yourself from the sensual pleasure of seeing, but also at this time, it certainly doesn't matter as it is not drawing your attention and your mind is nicely collected. It's okay. If they want to be open, let them be open. He understood uh, thus, there is an escape beyond. And with the cultivation of that attainment, he had confirmed that there is. Again, monks, with the fading away of joy, Sariputta abided in equanimity, mindful and fully aware, still, still feeling pleasure with the body. He entered upon and abided on the third jhana, still feeling happiness with the body. He entered upon and abided in the third jhana, on account of which noble ones announce he has a pleasant abiding who has equanimity and is mindful. So as you heard, the third jhana involves the fading away of joy. And of course, this can be confusing for one who is so confident in the joy that they get when they sit down to meditate and you sit down and the joy doesn't arise and you're left in that situation like you said of trying to control your experience and wanting it to come up and that's not working um, but one knows this is okay because your mind is settled mind is very calm and body is incredibly comfortable the third jhana is incredibly comfortable to be in. Even more pleasant than the second jhana. And this can be surprising. Why would being comfortable in body be more pleasant than intense joy? Yeah. Well, joy gets a little annoying after a while. It, yeah, it's kind of coarse mind would prefer to be calmer than that. 
believe it or not. And, um, but that is the case. So when one figures out that it's okay for the joy to go away, it's in K to be enjoy the comfort and be with equanimity in the object of meditation, uh, one can go deeper into the third jhana. As one goes through the third jhana, one starts losing body sensation. Initially, maybe a body apart for a period of time might not feel your feet or your knees. Your hands might disappear for a while. And eventually, a uh, body will start to disappear quite a bit. This is because as you go deeper, you're letting go of more craving and less contact and the body is happening. There is less to feel. And this is a useful state. When you have some degree of mastery of the third jhana, you can enter the third jhana in times of pain, in times of injury, and start not feeling particular parts of the body. It's a nice trick to have in your tool book when you bonk that finger. That's a new habitual tendency to engage in, is releasing and relaxing the pain and entering jhana. And the states in the third jhana, the equanimity, the pleasure, the mindfulness, the full awareness, and the unification of mind, the body feeling perception, formations, and mind, the enthusiasm, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity, and attention. These states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. Known to him, these, those states arose. Known they were present. Known they disappeared. He understood thus, there is an escape uh, beyond. And with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is. Again, monks, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, Sariputta entered upon and abided in the fourth jhana which has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. In the fourth jhana, equanimity becomes the predominant uh, uh, characteristic. You really start developing strong equanimity in the fourth jhana. Strong equanimity can be remarkable. Not having aversion to pain or a desire for pleasure the first couple times you experience that quite, quite remarkable. As you start abiding in the fourth jhana more, equanimity pervades your life and you start noticing fewer reactions to things that normally triggered you. And again, this can be pretty marked. Most people, many people, have a story when they notice the equanimity of the fourth jhana or jhana practice happening. It can be things like getting in car crashes, and not having cortisol and fear response. Um, it can be things like interacting with that toxic person that triggers you. And guess what? They didn't trigger you. The thing that they always says that gets you doesn't. Yeah. Amazing. And you know you're normally triggered by these things, but it doesn't happen. And you have full awareness. So you can see what's happening and respond appropriately. Even though you have equanimity, this doesn't mean you don't respond. It actually means you can respond more effectively. And the states in the fourth jhana, the equanimity, the neither painful nor pleasant feeling, the mental unconcern due to tranquility, the purity of mindfulness and the unification of mind, the body feeling perception, formations in mind, the enthusiasm, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity, and attention. These states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. Known to him these states arose, known they were present, known they disappeared. So as you're going deeper into the fourth jhana, you start losing all body awareness. Uh, I should say most body awareness. 
you'll remain uh, feeling your seat uh, and often remain feeling the top of your head. But this is about all. Uh, this is a very interesting state to be in, um, particularly if you're meditating with an open window because you can be sitting there, because you still have the ability to feel sensation. You just are not. If you direct your attention and really try to feel what you're touching, you can direct your attention and feel that. If someone touch, come and, and comes and touches you, you will feel that. If someone says your name, you will feel that. But if you're meditating with no sensation at all and a breeze comes and uh, strikes your arm. It can be your arm just will light up out of nowhere and then go away again. It's, uh, your equanimity can be that strong and your collectiveness can be that strong. And as you're losing body awareness here, the meditation changes. So the feeling in your chest, uh, the loving kindness in your chest moves up to your head. It moves up quite automatically and on its own. Um, you can't feel your body, so where is it going to go? Yeah. And sometimes this starts to happen at the end of the third jhana as well. Uh, but as you get deeper here, the feeling will start to go up into the head. When this happens, uh, let it happen. This is another change that can be confusing. You can try to push it down into your chest again, but that will be pretty awkward. And initially you may find it sometimes wants to come from your chest for, uh, for a, few, a few times, and you can let it come from your chest. It'll naturally come up to your head again. And when it is consistently coming from your head, then we change instructions, meditation instructions. Uh, your equanimity is such now that you can send to anybody and your mind will not shake. And so you're ready to send to all kinds of people, including other friends, family members, adversaries, all of them. And then we send to uh, the directions and the world. When the loving kindness goes to your head, uh, there are specific instructions and we can talk about it then. He understands thus, there is an attainment, uh, there is an escape beyond. And with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is. So when Sariputta is saying he understands that there is an attainment beyond, this is because he is understanding what is happening with these states that arise and pass away. He is seeing that they're impermanent, uh, seeing the three characteristics, seeing they're dependently arisen and unsatisfactory. Um, he is able to observe change in the jhana and able to understand uh, that indeed these states are not, uh, these, they are unsatisfactory. And so he knows to look deeper look beyond that. Again, monks, with the complete uh, surmounting of gross perceptions of form, with the dis disappearance of gross perceptions of sensory impact, with non-attention to perceptions of diversity, aware that space is infinite, Sariputta entered in and abided in the base of infinite space. And so we are talking about Arupa states now. The Arupa jhanas are continuations of the fourth jhana. They are different aspects of the fourth jhana. Actually, all of these jhanas are subtractive. That is, the further you go in the jhana, the more is taken away from your experience. The less and less is there, and so what is revealed are these states. As you get rid of hindrances, and as you get rid of uh, uh, a, a gross thought, what is revealed is joy and happiness. As you get rid of more and more sensory impact, what is revealed is uh, tranquility. And as you go deeper, what is revealed is uh, the infinite space. 
As we enter infinite space, the feeling of loving kindness changes to that of compassion. This is a different feeling than, uh, than loving kindness. And when you have a change in feeling of your, uh, of, of your meditation object, that is the new object you should try to send. Um, don't try to make loving kindness be there necessarily. If your mind will, go right to compassion in that stage. Um, and the states in the base of infinite space. The perception of the base of infinite space and the unification of mind. The body feeling perception formations in mind. The enthusiasm, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity, and attention. You notice the five aggregates are still present in the, in the Arupa jhanas, though we do not have a perception of our body necessarily. It is like with the fourth jhana. If you are touched, if there is impact, you will feel it. But that is not what you're feeling when you're in the jhana. An infinite space can be aptly named infinite space uh, can be a sensation of expansion. It can be a sensation of expanding out and out and out um, further without center. People experience infinite space differently at different times though. And in fact, uh, the jhanas can, different factors may be more, more or less prevalent each time you enter them. And so every time you're in infinite space, it may not be the same experience of expansion, but in general, it is a, it is a sensation of getting larger and larger. So when we practice like this, we go through the jhanas as quickly as mind wants to. Uh, we go through them as quickly as mind will. We let mind lead us deeper and deeper. And so we may not spend a lot of time in any particular jhana, or we may. Sometimes people spend months, uh, years in the fourth jhana. Uh, sometimes they spend less than a session in the fourth jhana. It really just depends. It's not till much later in practice that you're really going to explore fully what the jhanas are like and really develop them. That's a later pr practice of uh, jhana mastery and determinations. When we limit our experience to one jhana, and when we do that, we really become familiar with all the ins and outs and how the jhana works. But until then, we go through as quickly as our mind wants to, whether it's one session or multiple sessions. He understands thus there is an escape beyond, and with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is. Again, monks, by completely surmounting the base of infinite space, aware that consciousness is infinite, Sariputta entered upon and abided in the base of infinite consciousness. Infinite consciousness, uh, the feeling of compassion changes to the feeling of joy which feels different than compassion. Uh, the feeling of expansion is not the same and one becomes aware of consciousness. Sometimes one may notice consciousnesses arising and passing away. The further we go in the progression of the jhanas, the more we let go of in our attachments and in the factors of our mind, and the sharper our attention and ability to notice the movements of mind attention becomes. As we go through the Arupa states, our ability to perceive things becomes more and more subtle. And until in the base of infinite consciousness, we begin to see consciousnesses arise and pass away. You may begin to see a consciousness arise and pass away. You may notice this at each of the sense doors. Um, arise and pass away. This can uh, appear like sound appearing to stutter very rapidly, be there, not be there, be there, not be there. 
or starting to see the frames in your visual perception or seeing consciousness light up and down again. Not everyone perceives these things in the same way. Don't go looking for that if you don't notice it, but you may. And the states in the base of infinite consciousness, the perception of the base of infinite consciousness and the unification of mind. And you notice the base of infinite space is not perceived in the base of infinite consciousness. We're perceiving a different base, so we would expect it to be different. The unification of mind, the body, feeling, perception, formations, and mind the enthusiasm, decision, energy, mindfulness, and equanimity, and attention. These states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. Known to him these states arose. Known they were present. Known they disappeared. He understood thus. There is an escape beyond. And with the cultivation of that attainment, he had confirmed that there is. Again, monks, by completely surmounting the base of infinite consciousness, aware that there is nothing, Sariputta entered upon and abided in the base of nothingness. As one continues meditating, the feeling of joy transitions into the feeling of equanimity. And again, we, uh, the sensation of joy is replaced with the calmer feeling. Um, and we radiate this feeling of equanimity. Uh, and this leads us into the base of nothingness. In the states in the base of nothingness, the perception of the base of nothingness, and the unification of mind, the body, feeling, perception, volition, and mind, the enthusiasm, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity, and attention, these states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. Known to him these states arose, known they were present, known they disappeared, he understood thus. So the base of nothingness, um, at this point, mind begins to be less aware of the external environment and is more focused on things arising internally. Um, it, it can be a very interesting uh, place to observe what is happening. And this is, uh, this is a place where uh, insight and clear seeing can be very sharp. Um, it can be a fascinating uh, state to be in. And by completely surmounting the base of nothingness, Sariputta entered in abund upon and abided in the base of neither perception nor non-perception. And this is as far as the Brahma Viharas go. To enter the base of neither perception or non-perception, one lets go of even equanimity. Uh, this happens quite automatically. Just like the joy of the second jhana becomes too gross for mind, the equanimity of nothingness becomes too gross for mind, and naturally mind will drop it. And entering into neither perception nor non-perception. Neither perception or non-perception non can be difficult to identify at first. Uh, it can feel like one has fallen asleep, but one is not asleep, and afterwards one reflects back and realizes, no, indeed, I was not asleep. It is more difficult to have insight during neither perception or non-perception. So as we enter it, we, uh, and it, we exit it, we reflect back on what happened in this state. It's in neither perception or non-perception that our sense doors start not operating as they did before. And we may not perceive sound. Uh, we may. We may not perceive time. We may. When we reflect back on what happens after our sit, take a second to 6R anything you remember about that state. Your object is your quiet mind. This will naturally transition from equanimity and mind will just rest in the stillness. 
there is motion happening in neither perception or non-perception. And when we have the habit of relaxing, we can relax with the small little movements as they come up. As we get in these deeper states, the six R's become more and more subtle. If we were to try to fully six R in, uh, in either perception or non-perception, that would, that would kick us out. Yeah, that's a lot of movement. So at that time, we are only relaxing in response to the small, uh, small ripples that come up. As, as he emerged mindfully from that attainment, having done so, he contemplated the states that had passed, ceased, and changed thus. So indeed, these states, not having been, come into being, having been, they vanish. So afterwards, he reflected on what happened. Regarding these states, he abided unattracted, unrepelled, independent, detached, free, dissociated with the mind rid of barriers. He understood there is an escape beyond, and with the cultivation of that attainment, he had confirmed that there is. So as we follow the Brahma Viharas, through metta, through compassion, through joy, to equanimity, there is a movement and direction of mind towards greater and greater stillness. We are riding these as they automatically take us through deeper. We don't control our experience. We just attend to the Brahma Viharas and they will take us deeper and deeper. And this motion of mind this habit of going deeper will persist through neither perception or non-perception as we train our mind that way. Though our object is just quiet mind, mind will naturally go deeper and deeper as we've trained it to. Again, monks, by completely surmounting the base of neither perception nor non-perception, Sariputta entered upon and abided in the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. Perception and feeling and consciousness are conjoined. They always co-arise together. And his taints were destroyed by his seeing with wisdom. So when enter, one enters into the cessation of perception and feeling, one is not aware one is in the cessation of perception and feeling. One cannot intend to enter into the cessation of perception and feeling. You cannot try to do it. Guess what? Any trying involves consciousness, volition. Any, any craving, any longing will prevent you from entering this. What allows you to enter it is the habit of your mind of relaxing, going deeper and deeper. And when it happens, it happens. All you do to enter the cessation of perception and feeling is rest in quiet mind and relax. And let mind rest there and settle down more and more. When one is resting in either perception or non-perception, mind can get restless. It can get bored, especially when mind is nice and quiet. Nothing's happening here. I might as well get up. This is so ordinary and boring. I can't possibly be having a good sit. This is not right. Yeah, anything but dealing with not much happening at all. So when you're sitting in the state, have fun with your funny mind telling you to do something else but the best thing, which is to rest in the highest base of clinging, the best thing to cling to, which is neither perception or non-perception. So that's how you enter the cessation of perception and feeling is by not trying and resting in quiet mind. He emerged mindful from that attainment. 
when one enters the cessation of perception and feeling, one emerges um, and there's no awareness of what happened before or what happened during. It's a complete blackout. And blackout is even strong of a word. Maybe there's some perception of blackout before and after it ha actually happens, but the actual cessation is nothing. No consciousness, no perception, nor f no feeling. Having emerged from that, mind is incredibly pure. The deeper and deeper you go through the jhanas, the more and more purified mind is. And when you enter the cessation of perception of feeling and exit it, mind is incredibly pure as it watches things start again. When you emerge from that, you may notice and see the links of dependent origination. The first time you do this, uh, you may notice them come up and pass away. And after that happens, there is the experience of Nibbana, of the unconditioned. This is uh, stream entry or attaining path of Sotapanna. By seeing a dependent origination, by experiencing Nibbana, you have a complete perspective change and you have experienced the unconditioned, and you have not done that before. And this is a tremendous relief. With the attainment of Sotapanna, immediately after that comes relief and joy. And the joy is remarkable. The joy will persist for a period of time. 24, 48, 72 hours or more, um, the effects of this will be noticeable. It's not a small thing. When this happens, um, fetters are released. Because of your clear seeing of how this works, now your perception and understanding of the world is forever different. Um, you lose uh, doubt. You know that the path works because you have experienced it. It's not a matter of confidence, it's a matter of experience. This happened, I did this, and it resulted in that. And this change is because of what I have seen. Uh, and because of this, your uh, Be reliance on rites and rituals, belief that rites and rituals will somehow be liberating, is gone too. Because again, you know how this happened for you. And the belief in a personal self is gone. You have seen states without a personal self. And you know how that is. Conceit is not gone. The I am will come back. That is not released too much later, but you know things have in personal nature. You've seen it. So the first time that happens, this is, uh, this is called path. Uh, this this attainment uh, theoretically can be lost. Um, it can be lost with uh, a great, a grievous breaking of the precepts um, like that. So it's important to watch your mind and behavior uh, until the experience happens again. The best time to start working for the second experience or to start, start allowing the second experience to happen is right after the first attainment. Now, this is maybe the last time you want to be doing that because you're so happy and joy and mind is, you want to talk to people and have, yep, yeah, it's not sit down, and, uh, yeah. But this is the time you sit down. For most people, many people, it happens reasonably quickly afterwards in hours, days, 
Sometimes it happens after retreat. Um, sometimes it happens years later too. It's hard to know. These things happen because of you, your your karma, your your karma, your what is what's going to happen. We can't make these things happen. So the instruction is after this happens, you go back and sit some more and do it again. And don't want it to happen again. Just do the practice. Yeah. With your clear mind, it will, na it will be naturally uh, inclined to happen with the purity of mind at this point. Uh, when it happens again, this is called fruit or fruition. And the attainment is locked in at that point. When you have them close together and you can see the resultant states, you can see that the joy is different. The, the relief happens, the upwelling of joy happens after fruition too. Uh, it's when, you, when they're close enough, you can notice that it's a different feeling. Um, and so uh, if they're far apart, you may not notice. And just have joy and relief. The later stages, when you keep practicing um, and you keep letting go of attachment, these later stages will happen on their own like this as well. Again, we don't make these things happen. We set up conditions, we do the practice, and they will happen when they happen. The, the next set of fetters at the next stage, called Saktagami, are weakened. Sensual desire is weakened and ill will is greatly weakened and attenuated. The first time, there may or may not be personality change. You will have perception change. Um, things may, your sense uh, doors may operate differently. Things may seem brighter more focused, more clear. There may be differences in how you perceive the world. Um, when you start attenuating sensual desire and ill will, um, how we are in the world changes and there's real noticeable personality change. The second stage, Saktagami, happens in the same way as the first stage. Uh, there, is a, there is a cessation and after the cessation, one sees the links of dependent origination. The first time, you actually may or may not see them clearly. It's possible that for Sotapanna, you actually don't see them precisely. Um, you may reflect back and, and remember them. That certainly can happen. Or you, a memory may be triggered and be like, oh yes, that did happen. Uh, but at Saktagami, uh, you see them clearly. Uh, you see how they arise and pass away. After that happens, there is the experience of Nibbana again. In later paths, the experience of Nibbana is more clear. The, the seeing of the links of the dependent origination is more clear. And the, the change is, is deeper. Like Sotapanna, Saktagami is uh, path and fruit, and so you practice for fruition, and when we have fruition, then the attainment is, is sustained. It can be anxiety provoking to talk about having to lock in a fruition. I will say the texts are pretty clear. However, if anyone to pa is, passes away without attaining fruition, they will, they will not leave this world without attaining fruition. That is, it is pretty clear this will happen before you pass. So that, that is written pretty, that is written clearly. So it's, if there's concern, oh no, when will it happen? Nah, it will, it will, yeah. At Anagami, uh, sensual desire and ill will are eradicated. And at Arahatship, um, the last five fetters are eradicated. Uh, conceit. Restlessness, ignorance, desire for rebirth in heavenly realms, form realms, or immaterial realms. Desire for any kind of existence at all reached true dispassion for. 
an arahat with fruition has completed the task. Uh, they are done with the path. They have attained a similar state of mind to the Buddha, and which is why the Buddha taught. Now, the Buddha uh, has had developments that were more than matter of arahat in terms of ability to teach and wisdom and other faculties like that. And that's necessary for the Buddha had to discover the path without any help. Arahats have the luxury of having the Dhamma and the Sangha to learn from. It is a tremendous gift that is left to learn, uh, learn this. So that's the difference between an Arahat and the Buddha is the ability to discover and teach. He emerged mindful from that attainment. Having done so, he recalled the states that have passed, ceased and changed thus. So indeed, these states not having been come into being, having been, they vanish. Regarding these states, he abided unattracted, unrepelled, independent, detached, free, dissociated, with a mind rid of barriers. He understood there is no escape beyond, and with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is not, there is nothing beyond. Monks, rightly speaking, were it said to be of anyone, he has attained mastery and perfection in normal, noble virtue, attained mastery and perfection in noble concentrate, noble collectiveness, attained mastery and perfection in noble wisdom, attained mastery and perfection in noble deliverance. It is of Sariputta indeed that rightly speaking, this should be said. Monks, rightly speaking, were it to be said of anyone, he is the son of the Blessed One, born of his breast, born of his mouth, born of the Dhamma, created by the Dhamma, an heir in the Dhamma, not an heir in material things. It is of Sariputta indeed, rightly speaking, this should be said. Monks, the matchless wheel of Dhamma, set rolling by the Tathagata, is kept rolling rightly by Sariputta. This is what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So any questions about that? Yeah. Higher paths, that can be confusing. Um, what I didn't talk about is mastery of cessation and that there can be cessations without the experience of Nibbana. And these happen more and more frequently as you proceed along uh, the path. So the, yep, you can, you can identify the experience in Nibbana is pretty clear. Um, and a large experience of Nibbana will, is associated with path. You can understand Nibbana um, uh, through cessation sometime, uh, but it is not, the paths are big deals with big relief and big release with them like that. The real way, but, but as you progress, you, you know, there, and as you have more and more mastery and cessation, big experiences happen more, right? And it absolutely can be confusing. Um, yep. And they can be absolutely fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So the real gauge is what is happening with your fetters. Yep. And, and how they're operating. Uh, not just that you had a big whopping cessation that lasted for three days. Because that, that will happen when you're working on mastery of cessation. That's what, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but were the, were the fetters affected by it? And another thing people can run into is they try to repeat the fruition that happened before. They're like, oh, I did this. I directed my mind this way, let's do that again. Yeah, and then you can do that again, but that's not a new path necessarily. You just, <laughs> you just did that again. Yeah. New paths are a result of letting go of attachment and cultivation and development, and they, they happen on their own. We don't really get to pick. Yeah. 
but we get to experience cessation and have wonderful experiences along the way. Yeah, yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. The fetters are described many places. The higher and lower fetters are, are explained. Um, you can look in uh, the 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 DN uh, thirty three. That's a sutta that talks about the different fetters. Um, fetters. Uh, so yeah, th this is talked about. Well, let's share some merit. May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddhist dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.